This is Gary Stieber with a message from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. This is the familiar story of the startling way that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after his resurrection, especially Thomas. And we all know him as Doubting Thomas. And we'll see Jesus gives conclusive proof of his resurrection. Now Jesus in his resurrected body gives the disciples and us five things. He doesn't give us new teaching. The teaching that has been given is complete. But there are things that Jesus wants us to have. And that's set against the backdrop of Thomas, who's unable to believe that Jesus appeared to the other disciples. Now whether you're a believer in Jesus as the Messiah and God in human form, or have doubts as to whether any of this is real, this message is for you. This message will deepen your faith in Jesus or give you every reason to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Now, if you follow the Explore the Bible study schedule, like we do, we give away our study materials for free, with no obligation. We publish every week, 7 to 10 days prior to the lesson's scheduled date. And if you'd like to get the complete study notes, along with the presentation to use as your needs require, click on the link below and give us the email address that you'd like to have notified. Each week we'll send you the link to the church website where you can download the materials. Now let's start by setting a little context, as we always do. Now we've seen that after Jesus' death and burial, the disciples were rightly confused and in despair. And that changes to wonder and excitement on Easter, on resurrection morning. And we've already seen Jesus is risen and that he's shown himself to Mary Magdalene after Peter and John investigated the empty tomb. Now, between John chapter 20, verse 18 and verse 19 is the Emmaus Road story that's recorded in Luke chapter 19. That's the afternoon of Easter Day. And in the story that we look at today, we'll see that it's now Easter evening. Now, let's go ahead and pick it up in John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now this day is identified the same way as it was in verse 1, with a Jewish legal description of the first day of the seven. And we would call that Sunday, but that term isn't used in the Bible. And the verb that's translated here as locked is a word most commonly translated as shut, but it's in the Greek perfect tense and in a case that implies ownership. The perfect tense implies that it's been shut in the past for all time, not needing to be repeated. The picture is that of an owner who has closed the door with the expectation that no one will be able to enter, which is why many versions translate this as locked. These doors, plural, were locked in a way that's given great emphasis. Now the question is why? Well, because the disciples were fearful of the Jewish leaders. They killed Jesus, but they believed the testimony of Mary Magdalene and the testimony of Peter and John as to what they've seen, but they have no idea what's going to happen next. The doors were shut and they weren't opened, but Jesus came in and stood among them. Now when it says Jesus came, the word came is a common word used over 600 times in the New Testament. What isn't common is that Jesus came into a room that was inaccessible to any normal person. Jesus was able to pass through the locked door or through the wall. And he does that in the same way that he passed through the grave clothes and the tomb that was cut out of rock and the opening was covered by a large rock. Now, while Jesus was alive, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And he limited himself to the laws of humanity. He couldn't pass through a door any more than you or I could under this self-imposed limitation. But beginning with his resurrection, his body was changed in some way that made these kinds of things possible. Now the term disciples here may mean that there are more people than what we think of as the original 12 disciples. Judas, of course, wasn't there. And we'll find out later that Thomas also wasn't there. But Luke chapter 24 suggests that there may have been more there than the remaining 10 present on this particular occasion. Now the phrase, peace be with you, is a common Jewish greeting, but it's much more than a greeting. The phrase speaks of being complete with God's purpose, and we can understand that to mean doing the work of the Father, which is our call in our life. Now, of the five things that we see that Jesus gives here, the first thing Jesus gives is peace. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. And there are three aspects to peace in the Bible. There is a peace with God, and we get that through faith in Jesus. 
Paul tells us, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're told that in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. And we also have peace from God. Speaking of Jesus, Paul says, For he himself is our peace, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. We're told that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. And finally, we have the peace of God. And Paul put it like this, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He tells us that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Now, Jesus didn't come to scold the disciples for scattering during the crucifixion because that was all part of the plan. He comes to encourage the disciples and remind them why they've been chosen to be part of God's purpose in changing the world. Now, it seems that they didn't recognize Jesus immediately, but they certainly did after seeing his hands in his side. The second thing Jesus offers is proof to the disciples that it is he. Now imagine how big the understatement is that they were glad when they saw the Lord. The word translated glad is most often translated as rejoice, and they likely rejoiced like they never had before on this evening. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Jesus repeats the message, peace be with you, no doubt to quiet the disciples down. And after doing so, the third thing that Jesus gives the disciples is an assignment or a mission as he was sent on assignment as a messenger. This sentiment was in Jesus' prayer to the Father for all of his disciples, including us today in John chapter 17, verse 18. Now, let me ask you a question. If we're sent as Jesus was sent, what does that mean exactly? Why was Jesus sent? Well, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. We're told that in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus didn't come so that we would know more intellectually about God or to improve our economic or our social standings. He didn't come as a conqueror, which is what Pilate was afraid of. Jesus did a lot of things to demonstrate that he was the Christ like healing people and walking on water. But those were all secondary, done so that we would know that Jesus is the Christ that Scripture had foretold. And we see the fourth thing that Jesus gives the disciples is the Holy Spirit. And we see a change happening to the disciples here. There's a relationship between receiving the Holy Spirit and being saved, spiritually speaking. For the disciples to be sent as Jesus was sent, there's a necessity for them to have the Holy Spirit in them. And the same is true for us today. Now, God breathing new life into a person is a common event in the Bible. And that should bring to mind God breathing life into Adam, which is recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And we also know of an exceedingly great number of dead, dry bones that had the breath of life breathed into them in Ezekiel chapter 37. And there's an account of two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 that had the same thing happen to them after being dead for three and a half days. And here, Jesus breathing on them isn't meant to give them earthly life, but kingdom life, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there are different opinions as to what exactly is happening here. And we know that the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in power at Pentecost in the second chapter of Acts. Now, some commentaries say that this is where the disciples received new eternal life as believers in Jesus. And some say that they received the Holy Spirit here as they received the power of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost in a greater dimension there. And some say that this is a partial and a symbolic fulfillment of the giving of the promised Holy Spirit. And some say that this is Jesus connecting their need for the power of the Holy Spirit to the mission that he's sending them on. They can't, and we can't, be sent from the Father in our own power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, in either event, Notice that by Jesus breathing on them, they got whatever Jesus had. Now, we've lived in a world of social distancing and the wearing of masks in order to prevent that from happening. But the point here is that Jesus didn't give them something inferior. He gave them exactly what it was he had. Now, Jesus passed through closed doors with peace, with proof, and with purpose. God doesn't forgive sins because John or Peter or you or I forgive sins nor does he withhold forgiveness because we withhold forgiveness. This is a commissioning of the disciples to proclaim the gospel. Those who accept the gospel have their sins forgiven. 
and those who do not, do not. The disciples, including us today, can bring forgiveness of sin to sinners in this world by declaring the gospel to them. God's done everything to bring about forgiveness of sin. It's our duty to share it, but it's the responsibility of the unbeliever to accept and receive this forgiveness by accepting the gospel message. The fifth thing that Jesus gives the disciples is the authority to announce that a person's sin is either forgiven or not based on whether they accept the gospel or not. And he gives those same five things to believers today. And we could easily refer to this as the first time that Jesus gives the Great Commission. Verse 24, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, Jesus is going to use Thomas perhaps as a real-life illustration of this principle of a person accepting or not accepting Jesus by accepting the testimony of another person, of hearing the gospel and receiving the gospel. Now, notice that Thomas is a twin. Have you ever really thought about that? Who and where was the other twin? Well, in our study of John, we saw that we are like the woman at the well in a life of adultery, spiritually speaking, before our faith in Jesus. And we were just like the man born blind before our faith in Jesus. And here, before our faith in Jesus, perhaps we're a lot like Thomas in our doubt as to whether the message is real, so much so that we could be his twin. Now, when he says the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, the verb told is in the Greek imperfect tense, which means continual action. They kept telling Thomas that they've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. Thomas, we've seen the Lord. We don't know where Thomas was, But where he was really wasn't important. But what we see here is that distance from Jesus can develop doubt. We need to stay close to Jesus through prayer and stay close to the word in the Bible. And if we look in the wrong direction, we won't see the right thing. The real question here is, do we have defiant disbelief or do we have sincere doubt? Those are two different things. There's a difference between not having enough information to believe and there not being any amount of information that will ever make me believe. Now there's a double negative with a hard not in the phrase, I will never believe. Thomas makes a strong, defiant statement. Thomas doesn't accept their witness. Now there's the possibility that his position might change, but it's going to require absolute proof. And he doesn't need to just see Jesus. He needs to see his hands and more than see, he needs to literally put his hands into the hole in his side. Thomas has a mixture of defiant disbelief along with some healthy doubt. Thomas gets off lucky as history refers to him as doubting Thomas. This is Thomas in direct defiance. This is a Thomas who will not accept the testimony of more than one witness, and these were good friends of his, having been with them for three years. This is Thomas making a totally unreasonable requirement for Jesus to reveal himself. And the good news is that God can break through honest doubt and God can break through direct defiance. And John Ortberg says that there may be double meaning between Thomas being a twin and his doubt. The word for doubt is connected with the number two. The Bible often speaks of being double-minded, a term James uses in James chapter 1 verse 8. Now in Zechariah chapter 13 verse 6, we find the statement, and if one asks, What are these wounds between your hands? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. And Chuck Missler says, Jesus received wounds in the crucifixion, no doubt. But the unbelief of Thomas was the thing that wounded him greater. Our unbelief causes injury, so to speak, to the God of the universe. Now, if you have defiant doubt, if your position is that there's nothing on earth that's going to convince you that Jesus is the real Savior of the world, the question is, Why is that? Is it because somebody you like and admire holds the position that there's nothing that would ever prove to them that Jesus is real? Now, there's no more important matter for you to resolve this for yourself than the question of whether Jesus is real or not. Verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, the NIV translates this as a week later, But the original language is clear using the words octo hamera, which means eight days. And that's important. This is now eight days later. 
And as we've said before, the number eight in the Bible represents a new beginning and redemption. And that's what we're going to see here. Jewish boys are circumcised on the eighth day to signify a new beginning. And when you count inclusively, which is what the Jews did, Jesus was resurrected on the eighth day after being selected as the Passover lamb. And we see that same thing here, another eight days counting inclusively. Thomas has likely been hearing from the disciples repeatedly that they had seen Jesus for the past eight days. And now they're all together again behind closed doors. And we see the same expression regarding the doors that we had earlier in verse 19. And it's most likely the same location. This is the second time that Jesus appeared to the disciples. And Jesus gives the same greeting, which we saw as a call to be obedient to God's purpose. And the situation is described identically, except for the phrase, for the fear of the Jews, in verse 19. Now there's two possibilities here in that. Either they locked themselves in as they did in verse 19 because they're still afraid of the Jewish leaders, or they want to see if Jesus comes through the doors or the wall again. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Notice that Jesus knows the declaration that Thomas made previously. A dead Jesus wouldn't know what Thomas had spoken previously. Jesus speaks to Thomas personally with a command. The verb put is an imperative in both occasions here. And Jesus can't be locked in the tomb, and he can't be locked out of the room. Now the phrase do not disbelieve is also a command, and it's literally in the original language, stop being against the faith. It doesn't mean just disbelieving, but being against those who do believe. This again describes that there's only two conditions of the human heart in this world. A person either believes or is against the belief. There is no neutral zone where a person is categorized as one who is figuring it out. Now, I used to work with a person engaged in software development, and we know that software doesn't work correctly is said to have a bug. And someone was describing to him software that seemed to work right most of the time, but there was a bug that prevented it from working right all the time. And this man described that as software that doesn't work. Software that works right most of the time is software that doesn't work. It's not working right. It's not working correctly. It's supposed to work right every time, all the time. And in his mind, there was only two conditions. Software that worked reliably every time and software that didn't. And that's the same thought that's applied in God's word to a person's belief. You're either a believer in the truth or, as we see here, you're against the truth. Now, Jesus passes through closed doors with peace and proof once again. Jesus gives peace and shows proof for those who doubt. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think Thomas placed his hand in the side of Jesus? I'm guessing that when Jesus shows up, just as the other disciples had said, knowing what he had stated about his requirement to believe, that was probably enough for Thomas. And what does it tell us that Jesus commands Thomas to stop being against the faith? Perhaps it means that a person who is in direct defiance in regard to their belief in Jesus is operating out of their own personal will outside of the facts. They've chosen to not believe despite insurmountable evidence and proof. And as we've asked before, if that's you, the question is, why is that you? Jesus has given far more than sufficient proof for you to believe. You have to make a choice to believe, but being defiantly committed to unbelief is an unreasonable outcome given the evidence that Jesus provides. Now, when he says to see my hands and put your hand in my side, Chuck Missler has an interesting point here. The only man-made thing in heaven are the holes in the hands and the side of Jesus. And if you doubt the love of Jesus for you, all you have to do is to look at his wounds. And Thomas makes a personal declaration here, my Lord and my God. He acknowledges Jesus as the great I am, the relational God and the creator God. And the order is important. Jesus has to be Lord in order to be God. He can't be God if he isn't Lord. And we're not told whether Thomas inspected the hands in the side of Jesus or not. Greg Mott speculates that Jesus believed the others the second he saw Jesus, perhaps saying, I'm so sorry I doubted, Lord. I don't need to put my fingers in your side. You are my Lord and my God. And many commentators suggest that the appearance of Jesus probably made Thomas drop to his knees and make the claim that he says here. Now, David made a similar declaration when God revealed his covenant to him by saying, O Lord God, 
You are God, and your words are true, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 28. And when Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, we're told when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 39. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Some describe this as the last and the greatest of the Beatitudes. Notice that Jesus said that Thomas had seen him, not that he had seen and touched him. The two verbs for Thomas having seen and believed are in the Greek perfect tense, meaning done once and for all time. This is the moment that Thomas truly believes in Jesus as his Lord and his God. Now, Jesus doesn't say blessed are those who believe in fanciful tales without any evidence. Jesus has demonstrated divine evidence of his resurrection through eyewitness accounts. And John Ortberg says, we can't see electricity or love, but there's enough evidence of those things to believe in them. And David Guzik says that we don't lose a blessing by not being able to see the resurrected Jesus. We gain one. We all would love to be able to see Jesus. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. None of us have actually seen any of the miracles described in the Bible. And we can't see Jesus, yet we believe in him. Verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is our 24th lesson in the book of John, and we've stated John's purpose for writing his gospel many times in our study, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John didn't write a biography. He has a different purpose. And notice that these things were done in the presence of the disciples. This emphasizes their role as a witness, which is exactly the issue with Thomas. And notice also that Jesus is the Christ, not was. It's in the present tense, meaning continually. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God, which speaks of his being divine. And the life John refers to is eternal life with him in heaven when you die, and an abundant life here on earth during your life. And that final phrase, that these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's worded in such a way that if you're a non-believer, it's written so that you would become a believer. And it's worded in such a way that if you are a believer, it will serve to strengthen your belief by having a better understanding of who Jesus is. It's written to represent both purposes. Now let me ask you a question. How does that work exactly, gaining this life based on our belief? Well, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, we're told of Abram, before God changed his name to Abraham, he's the father of faith in God. Abram believed in the Lord's word and the covenant that he made with Abram, and we're told that the Lord counted it to Abram as righteousness. And this belief in Jesus is designed to transform our character, to make us become more and more Christ-like as we grow in him. And the phrase, by believing, is in the Greek present tense, which means continually believing. Believing in Jesus is meant to be a faith journey that we do for the rest of our lives. Now that sounds like the end of the book, right? But there's one more chapter to go where Jesus restores Peter, and we'll see that next week. Well, here's a question for you. What became of Thomas? Well, Thomas was the first person to take the gospel to India. India is a country of many faiths, but there's millions of Christians there today who can trace their spiritual ancestry to the guy that we refer to as Doubting Thomas. You see, he believed in Jesus as his Lord and his God, and he took the mission given to him seriously and changed the lives of millions of people. In 1964, India created a postage stamp in remembrance of Thomas. They created another one in 1972 on the 1900th anniversary of his death in India as a martyr for his faith in the year 72. A person of such defiance has left a tremendous legacy for his Lord. Okay, well, let's go ahead and summarize here. First, if you're a believer in Jesus, we see that his resurrection gives us peace, proof, the Holy Spirit, a mission, and authority. And we ask this question a lot. In light of all of that, how's it going? Is your life filled with the peace of Jesus? Do you have confidence in your faith based on the proof that Jesus provided? Do you feel empowered by the Holy Spirit in your life? How is your mission to save those who don't believe around you going? 
And if those aren't going all that well in your life, as we said earlier, distance can cause doubt. And as we've said many times, if we draw close to Jesus, he'll draw close to us. Second, I saw a video online recently of a person who was filled with the authority part, arguing with somebody that they were going to hell because of their lifestyle. Now that's not what the Bible teaches, nor is it the message of Jesus. It's also not the approach that Jesus used with Thomas, who had a very stubborn heart. Jesus treated Thomas firmly, but with respect and love. He met Thomas where he was, without scolding him. And the Bible teaches that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the only thing that saves a person. And not doing that is the only thing that keeps a person from being saved. This person that I saw online was filled with the authority, but short on the peace of God and the influence of the Holy Spirit, making them more than just a little bit out of balance. And the answer again is to draw close to God to get a better balance and a more loving approach. Third, if you're still not sure that Jesus is real, consider this. Harry Ironside was the pastor at Moody Church in Chicago from 1929 to 1948. He was preaching at a Salvation Army meeting one day when he was approached by a man who challenged him to a debate about whether Christianity had any merits to it. The man was an agnostic, and he was widely known for his ability to incite people on the topic of class hatred. And Harry agreed to debate the man on one condition. And the condition was that the man was to bring to the debate with him two people. The first was to be a man whose life was previously ruined and was considered to be what was known at that time as a down and outer. And it didn't matter if the man's life that he brought was ruined by alcohol or gambling or crime or anything else exactly. What mattered was this person whose life was ruined attended one of this man's speeches glorifying agnosticism and denouncing the Bible and Christianity, and that changed his life all for the positive. All he had to do was bring a man who could testify that he's found a new power in his life and has totally given up whatever sin has ruined his life, and now lives a life that's characterized by goodness, all by hearing this man describe how being a believer in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins is foolishness. And the second person was to be a woman of low character and a slave of degrading passions and corrupt living who met the same condition. Her life was previously ruined, but hope was born in her heart when she heard his message and now lives a clean and virtuous life. If he promised to bring two people meeting this qualification, Harry would bring 100 who met the same degree of despair in their life, but who was gloriously saved by the message of the gospel and whose life was completely transformed by the miraculous saving power of Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, the man who challenged Harry to the debate turned and walked away with a wave of the hand. He knew that his message and his whole philosophy were empty. It couldn't turn bad people into good people. It couldn't help anybody. Observation and experience point to people whose lives has been remarkably changed by belief in the faith of Jesus for 2,000 years. Now you won't find one person who's a believer in Jesus who's without sin. But you can't count the number of hospitals and schools and universities that were started by believers in Jesus for the sake of helping their fellow man improve their life. And finally, the question is, do you believe? That's why John wrote the book, so that we may believe. Can you say, like Thomas did, that Jesus is my Lord and my God? If you can't, the question is, what are you placing your hope in? If you're not yet a believer and you're looking for verifiable proof that Jesus is the true Savior of the world, well, I can't prove that to you. I can't meet that standard for you. And that's good news. You know why? Because God is a personal God and meets each of us where we are, just like Jesus did with Thomas. God can prove he's real to you in a way that's clear and unmistakable to you. And Jesus isn't likely to show himself to you in the way that he showed himself to Thomas or to Paul. Today, he works through people around you and the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. He said that in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Now, if your position is that there's nothing on earth that will prove that to you, well, God will absolutely prove it to you one day. Paul describes that by saying, speaking of Jesus, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, 
so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He says that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. You see, there will be a day of judgment, and every person will either joyfully rejoice that Jesus is Lord or grudgingly admit that Jesus is Lord after it's too late. And as a believer in the death and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, we see in this lesson that I have the authority and the responsibility to tell you that. And I say that sorrowfully, not in an angry, red-faced rant. My prayer is that you will consider all the proof that Jesus lays out about himself and take his words to heart to stop being against the faith. Take his encouragement that blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And if you'd like to know more about putting your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, you can reach out to us at the link below. We'd be happy to talk with you about that. And that's the lesson that I have for us from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And I look forward to our next time together.